On the 15th of September 1916, during the Battle of the Somme, British tanks would smash into the lines of German infantry who were left wondering what on earth was going on. To their dismay, they had to come against a foe that was the latest human technological advancement in warfare, the tank. Britain would become a long-standing pillar of tank production and development, establishing a heritage of capability in the means of armoured warfare that would go on to this day. The UK would make a number of successful tanks in World War II. Following the war would be one of the most dominant post-war tank designs ever, the Centurion. Eventually replaced by the angry sounding chieftain, which was also a great and successful tank in many uses, but would eventually, like all tanks, grow tired and old. Britain's tank heritage would continue however, and in 1983 it would be replaced by the Challenger 1 which would see great success in the Gulf as the British 1st Armoured Division advanced over 200 miles within 97 hours, destroying the Iraqi 46th Mechanised Brigade, 52nd Armoured Brigade and elements of at least three infantry divisions belonging to the Iraqi 7th Corps in a series of battles and engagements. Despite its success, it became clear to the British Ministry of Defence that if it wanted to maintain its competitive edge on the battlefield, it needed to come up with a new tank that would build up on the strengths of the Challenger 1 while eliminating its weaknesses. What they would come up with would be a cornerstone of modern armour. The Challenger 2. In 1986, Vickers Defence Systems, which we now know as BAE Systems Land and Armaments, took on the ambitious task of crafting what we now recognise as the Challenger 2. It wasn't just an upgrade, mind you, it was a complete overhaul of their earlier marvel, the Challenger 1. Fast forward to December 1988, and the Ministry of Defence was placing an order for a prototype. Now, while at a glance it might share a few similarities with its predecessor, the Challenger 1, don't be fooled. The Challenger 2 is a whole new beast, boasting a slew of cutting-edge design and technological advancements. In fact, believe it or not, only a mere 3% of the components are interchangeable with its predecessor, showcasing the magnitude of the transformation and why it's considered a completely different tank and not just a modernisation. However, this does make it understandable why many see them that way, as the two do look very similar from the offset. In June 1991, the Ministry of Defence allocated £520 million for 127 main battle tanks and 13 driver training vehicles. Another order of 259 tanks and 9 trainers worth £800 million followed in 1994. Production started in 1993 at sites in Elswick and Barnbo, involving over 250 subcontractors. The initial tanks were delivered in July 1994. After initial acceptance trials in 1994, the Challenger 2 underwent a progressive reliability growth trial in 1995 with three vehicles tested extensively. It was officially accepted into service in 1998. The in-service reliability demonstration ISRD, in 1998 was a crucial milestone successfully achieved in January 1999. During the ISRD, 12 fully crewed tanks were rigorously tested. In June 1998, the Challenger 2 joined the British Army starting with the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards and the last batch was delivered in 2002. This marked a significant advancement in armoured warfare. So what makes the Chally? It's probably fair to start with the basics coming in at 3.5 metres wide and 2.49 metres high, the tank is about average when compared to other NATO MBTs. It weighs 65 tonnes standard, with an add-on armour modules for combat bringing it up to 75 tonnes. And yes, you heard that right. She's a heifer. Managing to even beat out the Abrams in terms of weight. Luckily, this weight still shifts with a 1200 horsepower 26.1 litre Perkins V12 diesel engine giving the tank a top speed of nearly 40 miles an hour. 
And while it does seem behind many of its peers in acceleration to this level, this is aided by its second generation non-adjustable hydro-pneumatic suspension, making its off-road mobility quite capable. The mobility is perfectly acceptable, but in the modern world it's fair to say that it's beginning to fall behind. The weight also limits mobility, as while the Challenger 2 does indeed offer excellent protection, as always, the more protection you want, the worse your mobility is inevitably going to be. In some parts of the world where infrastructure is not capable of handling its weight, this can be a bit of an issue. Although military engineers can outfit bridges to withstand this. What makes up its weight is largely the armour, which on the Challenger 2 is its second generation Chobham armour, also known as Dorchester, claimed to have twice the effective protection against heat projectiles than rolled homogeneous armour. For combat, the Challenger will receive added on explosive reactive armour. It's worth noting, there is a large weakness in the front lower glassy, and this weak spot ultimately led to some poor sod of a driver losing his toe in Iraq, seeing some of the worst injuries in British tank crews that would be experienced against enemy forces in that war. This is a common area in tanks to have thinner armour, due to most hits being on upper parts of the hull and turret, as this lower section is often hidden in defilade, hull down positions, or concealed from the enemy in other ways. Nonetheless, it is a weak spot, one that also seems present on the Challenger 3 from early photos, but this is covered in extensive add-on armour when fielded in theatres of conflict. The Ukrainians that received Challenger 2s also seem to have attempted to limit this weak spot with added-on armour of their own style. When it comes to situational awareness, the Challenger isn't bad, but it isn't great. A common theme when analysing a good tank that's just getting old. One of the upgrades in the Challenger 3 is the integration of independent Commander Panoramic Thermals, something the Challenger 2 doesn't have, with only one thermal imaging system. Nonetheless, the Commander does still have access to a panoramic site. Some limited packages do however make this change to integrate Commander Thermals. What a tank needs to do after it sees a target is shoot and that is done with its L30A1 rifled 120mm gun, and this is truly the unique aspect of the Chally, and the root of much discussion which we will touch on shortly. The L30A1 gun is made from high strength electro slag remelting steel with a chromium alloy lining to prevent the rifling being an increased maintenance burden over smoothbore guns, making it not as bad in this regard than many originally assume when discussing its shell spinning nature. The L30A1 fires among many rounds its infamous Hesh round, which is a plastic explosive squash head projectile as well as its L27A1 APFS DS alongside smoke. The Hesh is the predominant high explosive round, also used against infantry, but it's doubtful if this is as good as dedicated high explosive rounds. Again, a very minor issue fixed on the Challenger 3, as it will be able to fire the latest M1147 advanced multi-purpose round. But until then, Hesh will likely do a very adequate job at keeping enemy infantry at bay. The APFS DS round is ultimately one of the main reasons behind the change to smoothbore, and this takes some explaining. First, APFS DS rounds are about as effective as they are long, given the materials are the same. This means shorter darts are simply not as effective and carry less penetrating power. But why is this limited on the Challenger 2? Well, see the two-piece ammunition setup on the L30A1 is ultimately the issue here. Firstly, its ammunition storage is great for keeping the reactive propellant charge lower in the hull in protected storage bins, but is not as effective as blow-up panels, while still decent. And this limits the length of the projectile that can be fielded. However, even without this storage problem, it's still not perfect. Now, when it comes to kinetic energy rounds like APFS DS, we're talking about a whole different ball game from Heat and Hesh. You see, these rounds rely on something called sectional density, which essentially means they're packing a whole lot of mass into a small, focused point. This gives us those sleek, elongated projectiles that punch through with sheer force. When you're dealing with single piece ammo, you've got more room to play with. That projectile can stretch further back into the propellant, allowing for maximum length within a given shell size. But when we're talking multi-piece, 
well, that flexibility goes out the window. So now let's talk about the British Kinetic Energy Ammunition. We don't have exact figures on its penetration, but if we take a key from the Russian examples facing a similar issue, it's safe to say it might not hold up as well as an American or German single piece rounds. Sure, it may have done the job against the Rocky tanks in the Gulf War, but put it up against something more modern and it could raise some serious concerns. The Russians' issue with this is even harder to fix due to their autoloaders, as the British round can be slightly larger, but it seems instead they have simply opted to swap this problematic gun out completely. Lastly, one thing my fellow Brits may not want to hear is the rifle gun isn't really any more accurate than the smoothbore guns on the Leopard and Abrams, and it's questionable if there's little if any advantage at all anymore. While many want to keep the gun due to this inbuilt British stubborn attitude that whatever we've got must be best, we should instead want to ensure our own military provides the best tools capable for the guys in the field. After all, it's their lives on the line. Thankfully, this is exactly what's happening. This isn't to say the Challenger would be unable to destroy tanks such as the T-90, but as newer and newer armour technologies are fielded, this becomes less and less certain. Don't worry though, the Challenger does make up for all this and makes every other tank seem completely useless in the field. Run off the 24 volt electrical system of the vehicle is the FV706656 cooking vessel. This unit can be used to heat food and, more importantly, water. See, hot water is imperative to allow a combination of a tea bag and a mug to ensure fit fighting morale is provided to the crew, giving a huge advantage in crew proficiency in the vehicle. Usually, a junior member of the crew is given the honorary and highly important role of being the BV commander, and must know the exact amount of time a tea bag should be left in before it's taken out. It should go without saying, any vehicle without this incredible technology fitted is quite clearly not fit for battle. <sighs> Moving on. The Challenger 2's protection is holding up pretty well, but as has been seen in Ukraine, it's still like all tanks that is ultimately held to the gods of modern warfare, artillery and mines. One was recently destroyed in Ukraine after it hit a mine on operations, being abandoned by its crew and then being destroyed by a Cornet ATGM. It's possible it was artillery instead that immobilised it, however with the fog of war we really can't take any assumptions of this. Once more, like the Leopard, many of ideological motivation are using this to jump on the tank as bad, and while it does indeed have flaws such as the outdated gun, lack of blowout panels etc, the armour itself doesn't seem to have performed any better than it could have been expected to do. After all, tanks are not invincible and the second the decision was made to send any such tank to such a high intensity conventional war, its fate was set, and it was inevitable we would be seeing these such tanks burning. Such is the case with the thousands of Russian tanks we have seen burning too. It doesn't simply mean they're awful tanks, but the fact they're sent to such a war makes this inevitable. So in conclusion, the Challenger 2 is not a bad tank, but out of the Western offerings, it's simply not realistic to call it the best, even if it holds a special place in my heart. It's capable, usable, but the endless march of time is starting to have its effect, and it is beginning to be a little outdated. It's also important to understand one massive issue that any British tank design inevitably has. While the Cold War and the Second World War gave the UK a genuine defence reason to have a large, good quality tank fleet, the times have changed. The threats of which the UK perceived are now much further away, and if anything, much less of a threat now than ever before. Britain in its current state has a navy very adequate to perform in the defence it needs against pretty much any nation it currently perceives as anything close to a threat. To the point that a Challenger 2 being used for actual defence of the British soil is, to put it lightly, very unlikely and would, if anything, come after the British nuclear arsenal has already been exhausted. This means that the army suffers from the government viewing tanks as the absolute last line of defence of the Isles, and is why upgrades are much less common than they are in tanks like the Leopard. So, while it's important to have an indigenous tank production capability, it's a balancing act of budget allocation and priority. And for an island nation, 
tanks simply get the short end of the stick. Different countries have different priorities. However, the expeditionary capabilities of the British Army are inevitably going to be weakened at the way things are going. It will be curious to see where Britain's armoured heritage will continue after the Challenger 2 and 3 respectively. Thankfully, the Challenger 3 goes a long way in fixing nearly every issue listed in this video. And if you'd like to see a video on that tank in the future, please make sure to subscribe to the channel and give this video a like if you enjoyed it. If you want to go above and beyond supporting the channel, join my patrons. Thanks for watching, I've been Kaboda and I'll see you next time.